please give a warm welcome to Cameron Strang and Ralph Simon. We're going to have some fun, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be a fascinating session because we're dealing with somebody who comes from not only a great, great creative sensibility and a great professional sensibility, but more importantly, Cameron's start in his career is essentially, quintessentially Canadian. Cameron, welcome. Give you a handshake. Ladies and gentlemen, give Cameron another round of applause. This is very important. Okay, so um, just to show you where it all began, let's, uh, let's just take a look here. There we go. This is where it all began. Does anyone recognize what that is? Aren't you all Canadian? Don't you recognize what it is? That's the most famous landmark in Western Canada. That, of course, is the bridge that takes you to West Vancouver. And that's where you were born. Yeah, that's where it all began, I guess. Ralph, you're right. I didn't know I was so shy, but I guess I am. Um, anyway, yeah, that's where it all began for me, I think. I'm proudly Canadian, so I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Neil and to Gary for inviting me. And. Um, I'm Canadian for sure, through and through, and I think it's one of the things that's made made my career go as well as it has, and has helped me through my life. And um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm proudly Canadian. So the amazing thing is, you come from a big family, five brothers. Your yeah. father loves opera. He instills in you an incredible sense of music and musicality. But what you decide to do is take a slightly different route, and you decide to go to do a law degree at uh, University of British Columbia. That's where you, you yeah, go, that's I, when you were born, as it turns out, but that's just the law school. Yeah, yeah, 1963, I wasn't there then, but no, uh, no. that's where I went Yeah, that, though, well, that's an important part of it. You know, I think um, Canada, one of the great things that, uh, you know, that, that Canada has to offer us is education, and incredible education, government supported. I mean, my last year of law school cost $1,500, and I did seven years at the University of British Columbia. And, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was terrific. But you always had this, this uh, thin skein of music running through your, your, your legal training and, of course, giving you great training for what you were ultimately to end up to do, which was, first of all, to start a music publishing company, and then you decided you were going to start a record company, independent record label. Other way around. A record label first, then music uh -huh. publishing. But... Um, yeah, look, what, for me, uh, growing up and going to, going to college, going to university, I didn't know anything about the music business. I'm a music fan, really, is what I am. I'm a glorified music fan. Um, I grew up listening to music. I thought it was normal, but looking back on it, I guess, you know, not a lot of kids that uh, skipped school in the 10th grade and took a Greyhound bus to Seattle to see the Stones. And two months later, I went back to see The Who and The Clash. And, um, you know, we spent a lot of our time fishing and, and doing kind of all the things we do in the West Coast. But then um, I also had a 71 Volkswagen van that probably went back and forth to San Francisco, Seattle. We'd drive to San Diego to see concerts. I mean, we went up and down the West Coast. And, um, and I always loved music, and it was just in me. I had no idea that it would be a career. You know, I probably had two great passions in my life as far as uh, at, a, at a young age. Um, before I met my wife but, and my kids. But, um, uh, you know, really, hockey, first of all. I couldn't imagine life without hockey until I turned 15. And of course, then, that's right. You're then I went fan. away. Hockey and, player, uh, a Canucks fan. Yeah, and then, and then music. So uh, I just feel fortunate to, to have the career I have and to, you know, ha have been from Canada. I think one of the other things that, that was really great in Vancouver and very different is... Um, you know, the, the, the mosaic of global communities that, that made up Vancouver and the amount of music from all over the world. I mean, we had such great, great artists. We had artists coming up from the U.S., of course. We had Canadian artists, and we had artists coming from Jamaica and Africa. I can remember seeing you know, so many great reggae concerts and Alpha Blondie when he first came from Africa to play, and um, just a lot of great memories of, of different music and punk rock. I, I remember I was thinking about it, you know, um, growing up, and I remember my first first month of high school. I got to high school, and in the first week, they showed a movie in the in the gym, and the movie was Woodstock. And I thought, man, that's ancient history. What are we watching Woodstock for? You know, um, not that I wasn't, you know, a huge fan and 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 all that, but. Um, 
and it was like two weeks later they were booking bands like the Subhumans and the Pointed Sticks and you know the Clash burst upon the scene and all that so we had such a connection to London and the UK and punk rock and all of that that it was it was, it was fantastic we got it all. So with New West Records uh, some of the people you met along the way included T-Bone Burnett the great great music producer and visionary in his own right and uh, you worked with uh, Canadian names like uh, Delbin McClinton the, the um, yeah I think for me and it was a great lesson for me and it was a huge part of my life is uh, is relationships and when I started in in the, in the when I started the record company you know I, I was the only employee for four years so it was me I learned how to do everything make records mix records um, make the deals make the deals um, all, all of that stuff and slowly we built it and we grew it to I think at the peak we had about uh, 22 or 25 employees and um, we were selling about in the low maybe I think our biggest years were 20 to 25 million dollars worth of music around the world and uh, but it really, it was, a, it was a slow network of relationships that built and built and built and built. And um, it was from, you know, one of the keys, I'll just tell a brief story because it shows you how fortunate we can be and, and how things work. But I met a fellow named Stephen Bruton at the Ironworks Barbecue in Austin, Texas when I was there one year. And um, we started talking and it turned out he was a record producer and he produced some records that I really loved. He produced Alejandro Escovedo, who's a great artist from Texas, and, um, and he was a guitar player. And I didn't know much about him, but we became friends and I put out his, I put out his record. And, and uh, I'd seen Delbert McClinton open the Vancouver Jazz Festival in 1991 and play at the Commodore and I was totally blown away. I was like, this guy's unbelievable. Why don't I know more about him? And um, so I cold called his house in Nashville to, to try to sign him because he hadn't made a record in a long time and I was a fan. <clears throat> and, you know, they thought I was crazy at first, but God bless Delbert and his wife, Wendy, who was answering the phone at the time. They finally agreed to take a meeting. And really they agreed to take a meeting because uh, it turns out they'd grown up, he'd grown up with Stephen Bruton. And he ran into Stephen and he said, you know, and Stephen said, hey, I met this kid at the Ironworks Barbecue and I'm yeah. doing some music with him. And Delbert went, that kid's been calling my house. And um, so anyway, uh, Delbert agreed to sign and he made a record and won a Grammy and sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And, On your label? Yeah, and it was fantastic. So, so, so it shows you how things work. It, it's amazing. Relationships are absolutely key and something that you've sustained throughout. And then you developed the publishing company. Publishing company was independent. Your very your thinking was independent, and then you get a call out of the blue from Edgar Bronfman Jr. in 2011. Yeah. He says, uh, "Hey, uh, I've been watching what you're doing, and uh, I need to have a chat with you. And uh, can I come and spend some time speaking to you?" Yeah, uh, that's Edgar. Um, well, I'll go back maybe a step, but um, excuse me, Michael. Oh, sorry. I'll go back a step, but Edgar. Um, well, first of all, Edgar is an, uh, one of the great music business people in the, in the history of our business, and, and he managed to do it all with such a elegance and grace that I, I, I admire him greatly, and he's, out, he's been very good to me. He's, he's helped me a lot in my career. And, um, but yeah, it, it wasn't quite that simple, but almost that simple. His office called my, my house one day and said, uh, called my cell phone and said, um, Edgar would like to meet with you somewhere private in Santa Monica. And I was like, oh, Santa Monica, somewhere private. Starbucks, probably not private enough, but um, maybe my house. So Edgar came to my house and um, we talked for probably three or four hours in the backyard. And we didn't really, we didn't talk specifically about, about you know, publishing or my company or, or those kinds of things, much more about business in general and, um, and uh, and life and how we saw things and how we saw the music business and the artists and, and that and at the end of it he, he said yeah I'd like to buy your company and I'd like you to to uh, run Warner Chapel so I said yes <laughs> like to buy your company like you to run Warner Chapel one of the biggest publishing companies in the world that's a great salute to your talent and a salute to Edgar for recognizing that a Canadian like yourself who now happens to be the only Canadian in the world running a major music and music publishing company at the same time. Oh, Tremendous achievement. Tremendous achievement. Wow. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, but let me say a couple of things. First, um, there are many, many, many great Canadians in the music business, so that, that's oh. humbling, and, and I'm sure most of them wouldn't want my job. That's why they don't have it. But, um, you know, I think that there's so much talent here in, in Canada, and it's uh, something I'm really proud of and, and, and something I'm very cognizant of. We have, uh, you know, we work with some great artists from here, of course. We have uh, on, the, on the label and historically at Warner Brothers, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young. And, uh, and then, you know, much more current artists, uh, Michael Bublé, who's a global superstar. Um, uh, Lights, who was here the other, was here last night. Um, Tegan and Sarah, Party Next Door, Majid Jordan, who did the Drake record, Hold On. Um, you know, we just have, we have so many uh, incredible artists from Canada. I saw one the other day, um, Steve Kane took me to see Scott Hellman, who's a terrific young artist. And, and also, I think, um, you know the the kind of the the the, the men and the and the people women who are who are a little bit um, well I won't say that they're older than me but they are a little older I guess but so many great people who have helped me you know um, uh, Bruce Allen who who who's terrific manager. who manages Michael and and um, Sam Feldman and Steve Macklin all from Vancouver Terry McBride who's helped us a That's lot a great manager. Um, here, you know, Steve Kane, who's a, I, inducted into the Hall of Fame yesterday, just absolute so inspiration. Well and uh, Vivian Barkley, who runs our Canadian publishing company, who I sat with yesterday while she essentially educated me on Canadian publishing issues. So, you know, she's brilliant in her own way. And, and songwriters, too. I mean, um, T Minus, a producer from here, Belly, who's on fire right now, writing with, with, um, with great artists in the U.S. And, yeah, it's fantastic. Now one of the key things that you did when you took over the publishing company was you made a, a really uh, informed choice of a key, key executive, a guy who's known as Big John Platts. So there's Big John on the left, and you and uh, Big John are flanking a rather diminutive man with big ideas, big ideals, and a uh, big purse of money, and that's Len Blavatnik, who bought the Warner Music Group from... Uh, uh, Edgar Bronfman Jr. and the shareholders, uh, but has become a great ally and a great believer in you. But Big John Platt is someone that you put a lot of faith in. He's done some incredible things in terms of signings. Beyonce, Jay-Z, Pharrell. I mean, really lifted up Warner Chapel music in an incredible yeah. way. Tell us yeah. about that. Well, John, I think, you know, John's one of the great executives in our business, not just publishing executives, but great music executives. He's um, you know, he's got an incredible work ethic. He's a great leader. He's a, he's he's an incredible person. His, he used to be a DJ on a radio yeah, station. Yeah, yeah. He's just he's he's something else. If you don't, I mean, I, I I don't know how I'd describe him, but he's larger than life. And for me, uh, when I got to Warner Chapel, you know, just um, Warner Chapel is I don't know if people know, but Chapel was was founded on Bond Street in 1811. So it's you know we're over it's over 200, 200 years, years old. old. Over, you know, I heard some of the guys talking earlier, but um, 1.2 million copyrights under management for us globally. We're, we have offices in I don't know how many countries, but basically everywhere you could imagine, China, Singapore, all over Asia, every, every country in Europe, South America. Uh, so it's a, it's a big, big global company with uh, incredible history. And when I got there, um, you know, we're, and, and through it all, I think 100% focused on, on great talent, great songs, great songwriters. It was um, the U.S. company founded by, um, uh, you know, founded when they put sound in film by Jack Warner at the film company. So the record label was 1958 or 59. The publishing company, I think, was 1928 in America. So, you know, Irving Berlin, um, George Gershwin, George Gershwin uh, Cole Porter, you know, all the way through uh, the band, Robbie Robertson, um, Radiohead, Lil Wayne, Jay-Z, it just, it's, it's incredible, so Katy Perry. Um, but uh, yeah, John, you know, when I got the gig, I was like, okay, this is, this is fantastic, and we were doing great, but um, I knew John as a competitor and a colleague, and I, and, and I, and I just knew in my heart if, if he would agree to come over and help me that um, we'd be unstoppable together, and, that's really what's happened. So we went from, you know, essentially the, the fourth, in terms of market share, fourth place amongst major publishers to first 
in 18 months, and then uh, Sony Body MI 2 and 3 joined together and leapfrogged us, but we don't count that. We're, we're still number one as far as we're concerned. <laughs> okay, so uh, that started a great uh, linkage for you, and then you were asked to take over Warner Brothers Records. Uh, wait, hold on a second. Here's uh, uh, Ahmed Balshi, also known as Belly, Love Me Harder, a very big hit, and earned it from Fifty Shades of Grey. Just thought to showcase him as a Canadian writer signed to Warner Chapel. Fantastic. Which is yeah. very good. Very good indeed. Um, and then you That's take John over... John and Vivian who, who did that. John and Vivian together did, did brought in Belly and what a career he's had. What a great writer. Uh -huh. Then uh, you take over the reins at Warner Brothers Records. You move to Burbank to their famous historic headquarters. And uh, when you're there, you've got to balance out the idea of looking at the great, great catalog of great artists, but you've got the sensibility, the drive, and the musically spiritual ambition of getting great new talent. So what I thought we'd do is we'd uh, go through a cascade of different acts, and I uh, just thought it would be good to get your views on A, what you thought of them, how you signed them, what you did with them, what your vision is for them. So why don't we take you on a quick magical journey on a musical magic carpet, and take a look, first of all, at Jason Derulo. Tell us about this. Jason Derulo, I mean, a superstar, uh, one of the first artists I met when I got there. Um, we're two, basically two and a half years into building his career, and uh, um, since, since I've worked, been, been working and been working with him, and um, the last album, I think uh, 2.5 album, 2.5 million album equivalents around the world. He's got a huge record right now. Want to Want Me is a terrific, terrific artist. Superstar. 45 million singles sold, digital Something singles. Something like that, yeah. Incredible. Yeah, and he's doing great. His, his new album is fantastic. The new song is a hit all over the world. I think we're, we're um, you know, number one, two, or three in just about every country in the world. So. Incredible. That's, that, that deserves a round of applause and, and props to, for that. Uh, let's go to the next one. Of course, uh, this is a wonderful uh, global band that's just been produced by Matt Langer, the guy that produced Shania Twain, Def Leppard, ACDC. I heard them playing Back in Black as we were coming onto the stage today, and I thought, aha, Muse. Muse, well, that, this, this ties it all together, Ralph. This is, this is us, Matt Lang from South Africa with, you know, an old friend of yours. Muse, who comes to us from the UK company, and, and a re new record comes out. Uh, June 8th or 9th, I'm not sure the exact date yet. But what does June, it sound like? Good. June 8th or 9th, it's fantastic. And, you know, uh, recorded in Vancouver. So there you go. Recorded in Vancouver, so there you go. Yeah. See this Canadian thrust, this Canadian These, yeah, and flick all the time? It's just, it's important. Really great to a, see a that. Fantastic rock band, if you haven't seen Muse. They're, they're Cause a Muse, globally, a just great massive. global attraction. Uh, three guys that have just transformed live stage work in a really interesting way. How about... Very interesting, uh, Adam Lambert. Yeah, Adam Lambert. So Adam Lambert, uh, we signed, he's just a you know, super talent. Um, obviously, the American Idol history and, and, and oh, a yeah. terrific person. Um, and uh, just new record produced by Max Martin and Shellback, who are so two of my So there's a story favorite. there, because when you were running the publishing company, you have cognited on getting together with Swedish songwriters. Max Martin, Swedish, who wrote a lot of the Britney Spears Backstreet Boys hits. How did you connect Adam and Max Martin and put that together and now come up with great material? And he's, of course, managed by Katy Perry's managers. Yeah, Adam. Katy Lang's uh, managers. Well, Max, Max, Max is larger than life. I mean, seven, seven time in a row, I think, as Cap Songwriter of the Year. You know, just so super Max talented. Martin. So he, um, he had done a song with Adam way back. Um, they had done a song together and he was always impressed with Adam and his voice and felt like if he could really dig in and make the record he could do something great. So um, they, he called and said they were, they were thinking of doing it and um, would we be interested in partnering and it was a mutual thing so the way we went and the first single's out now called Ghost Town, it's terrific, it's happening all over the world too. So Adam Lambert moved over to Warner Brothers Records, a whole interesting new flight path for him. Let's take a look at Kaya Stewart, just a debut single coming out. Why is she so good? Yeah, Kaya, I mean, incredible songwriter, amazing voice, young talent. So I think, you know, all these artists kind of uh, exemplify what we do uh, in terms of finding new talent, developing new artists. Also, um, 
you know, uh, sticking with artists during their career and, and helping them uh, build build huge careers like Jason and Adam and, and, and build those careers. And then superstar artists like Muse and, and uh, Neil Young and, and, uh, and all these kinds uh, just helping so them get to the So we better watch out for Kaya. You reckon she's, uh, uh, she's got the goods? She's fantastic. At the, rec the single, I think we're dropping the single in maybe next month, probably uh, middle of June. And she is a, she's a, she's a dynamic force and just terrific. Okay, let's go to the next one. This is Echo Smith. Good song, cool kids. These are siblings, all brothers, uh, sister and three brothers. Just quickly, on why you think these guys have got oh. it from LA to Luca Lake? Yeah, hits, hits. She, they've got hits, and she's a star and a family band, and just a great story. Developing career, you know, um, just a, a group of siblings. When we met them, signed them to the label. Uh, made a terrific record. They've had their first global hit with Cool Kids and their careers building. This month, it, uh, you know, unbelievable in, in a year and a half, this month they'll be um, uh, playing at uh, Rock and Rio in Las Vegas wow. on the same bill. Uh, well, right before actually, the, the bill is Taylor Swift is closing at Sheeran and Echo Smith, so they'll play to 85,000 people. Um, two years ago, they were kids from Toluca Lake, so Now that's a record label doing really the right developmental stuff for an artist. Really amazing. Let's have a look at Josh Groban. First time ever is at a UK number one on Warner Brothers Records. Yeah, Josh, uh, obviously massive superstar around the world, but to now really translating globally. So number one record in the UK last week, um, 180,000 albums in the US and just, uh, you know, great talent, great, yeah. great writer. And very funny. I like him. He's great. And then you did something that confounded all the critics. They said that you were nuts. They said you shouldn't pay the money. But you got Cascade, one of the biggest uh, DJs and artists. He's an artist DJ, really, in electronic dance music. Uh, there's a picture of him in action. You can see how hot he gets. The fire comes literally out <laughs> of his backside onto the stage. Looks like ACDC. Um, no, <laughs> Cascade, I mean, yeah, he's... Wonderful, wonderful, talented uh, musician and DJ, producer, songwriter. Uh, 60,000 people at Coachella on the main stage a couple yeah, of weeks ago on Saturday night just blew people away. He's, he's, he's kind of, he's, it's still growing and he's, he's, you know, he's been at it. Uh, he's one of the real pioneers of the genre and, and, and is a wonderful person and we support him and I think his career is going to explode globally. Incredible, great foresight from your standpoint to say, okay, we're going to press the button, we're going to cascade. Here's another great, great new talent, Royal Blood from the UK, uh, your, your UK company that you also, you oversee all of that, Max Lusada, the executive that runs it there. Great, great band. Yeah, this is, um, I don't know if any of you have heard Royal Blood, but they are a powerful, powerful band and just... Uh, amazing. The first time, I'll tell a brief story, I was in Richard Manor's office who runs the publishing company and he played a one song demo from two kids that they'd made in the garage and he said, I want to go sign this band. We said, great, go sign them and uh, they were royal blood. Ultimately, they signed to the record label, massive number one around, uh, around the UK and building in the US, uh, going to open for the Foo Fighters all fall. Just uh, a great band. That's, that's your kind of blood type, very good. And then, of course, the great Neil Young, who comes into your office on a regular basis in yeah. Burbank. Neil, I mean, what a force. Political activist, entrepreneur, inventor. Incredible career. Uh, absolutely love him. Musically, superstar, of course. Canadian to boot. But, Canadian um, to boot. But, you know, invented Pono, the Pono player. Brought That's me right. a Pono player. Brought me a, uh, a prototype Pono player loaded with music that he thought I might enjoy in the, in the highest digital quality. Incredible. And, uh, um, yeah, he, he, he's a force of nature. He's just awesome. And, and, and Elliot Roberts, who, who manages him too, you know, going all the way back, partnered with David Geffen. He's the dude. Yeah, just a trip to be with. Okay, then of course, Michael Bublé. Bruce Allen was telling me last night, $200 million ticket sales over the last nine months of Michael Bublé touring. I mean, this guy's like an automaton in terms of ticket selling. And you right behind that. Bruce, yeah, well. Uh, Vancouver. Vancouver, yes. Michael, Bruce, terrific partners. Uh, I think, um, you know, not only just incredibly talented, a uh, global superstar, 10 nights sold out at the O2 in London, 10 nights in a row, which is just 16,000 a night. Yeah, and, uh, you know, he's also one of the, one of just 
the most genuine, nicest people you would ever meet. He's been so supportive of me. Um, you know, one thing when you when you take over uh, or not take over when you when you become the leader of a of a record label um, when when you have the backing of superstar artists like Michael, who uh, who I tapped into his Canadian patriotism and his uh, Vancouver roots to support me, uh, it's made all the difference in the world. So I'm grateful to him. Okay, let's have a look at uh, Magic Jordan as uh, Hold On is now a big uh, record for Drake. Yeah, right? this is this is uh, uh, OVO. We have a partnership with with OVO, Drake's company, his record label, Forty and Oliver, who who are the really it's it's an independent company and we we um we just help out where we can but these guys have such a creative vision and the music they find is amazing um party next door and maji jordan are part of that and just terrific artists great lots of fantastic music coming i was over uh over there yesterday listening and it's going to be very exciting to to roll out the music so we couldn't be happier and of course one of the great great oh my, great creative talents of not only the previous disco era, but he is so hot. Daft Punk, just involved in so many levels. The creative uh, award that's awarded every year here at Canadian Music Week, named after Nile Rogers, a gentleman, an artist, a true artist. You signed him again, he decided to come back in. He could have been signed anywhere. Yeah, Nile. And you managed to talk him into it. Nile and Prince are both back with us, so uh, that's been fun. But Niall is, uh, you know, what can you say? Um, just one of the great songwriters, great producers, great artists. Not only all the things he did with, with Sheik, but um, you know, he, he produced so many huge records for Warner Brothers historically, from Madonna to Van Halen. Um, obviously the Daft Punk things he's doing today. Um, he's, he's a, and he's also just a terrific person. Wonderful um, person. Yeah, I can't I can't speak highly enough about him. But he, you know, his um, his creative ethos is sort of is all over Warner Brothers. So it, it's great to have him back and great to have him in the building and um, just to get to spend time with him and and hear him talk about songwriting and the way he goes about it and and his producing. Um, you know, uh, Let's Dance for David Bowie. I mean, it, the, the the list goes on. But the and fact on. that you managed to get him, you persuaded him to come and sign. That's that's certainly a salute to you for doing that because there are a lot of people talking in his ear. He's going to listen to what is creatively right for him, and you did it. Um, here's uh, someone that uh, is a Canadian, Party Next Door, just briefly. If you haven't heard it, you've got to check it out. It's just, uh, you've got to just listen. Nothing to say. He's on the cover of Fader in the U.S. this month. And, um, you know, just finished a sold-out tour all over the world. All the credit goes to uh, Oliver and Forty and OVO. Um, it, it, it's fantastic. Another good Canadian. About to explode, yeah. You created history by getting the first ever number one album for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is under your stewardship. So all the new acts you're developing and what you're doing with the publishing company. I mean, you're wearing two hats. You're wearing the publishing hat and the record label hat. I mean, it's uh, just a very interesting, there are not many other people globally that are doing this. So Cameron, this is, um, I mean, I'm not trying to just snow you in saying all of this, but uh, uh, just these achievements are really quite special. Thank you, thank you. Tom is, uh, what, what can you say? And Mike Campbell too. I, you know, I, I actually knew Mike Campbell before I knew Tom, the, the guitar player from the Heartbreakers. And I was always astounded because when we had the independent company and we were making records on no budget and, you know, we'd scour, we'd find old studios that would give us time for cheap and we'd get producers and we were, you know, we were, we were doing it on a shoestring. And Mike was open to, you know, hey, can somebody call him up? Who can get a hold of him? Will he come over and play a solo or something? And, and sometimes he'd do it. Or, you know, I, I remember one time he took us, we went to his house and uh, he let us use his studio for the day and he played a guitar solo on a record for us. And, he's, you know, I, I, he's, he's a terrific guy. And then, and then Tom, um, you know, one of the all-time greats, I remember. Uh, and seeing him in Vancouver when I was young and he's... Um, you know, I love his spirit. I love his, uh, I love, you know, he really is a rebel. He sings the song, but he's a rebel. He, he doesn't take shit from anybody, and he just it does it his own way. Amazing. Uh, Duran Duran, of course, you signed. Yeah. Still a great, great global well, following. This, this is probably, this is, uh, this is probably a good segue. Produced by Mark Ronson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also a good segue into Parlophone. They were on, on Parlophone, a, a UK company that Warner Brothers bought last year. 
uh, one of the great record labels in the history of the music business. Um, Universal bought them first and, and took a number of the acts out and then, and then sold, sold Parlophone to, to us. Um, but fantastic, we got some great artists and they have a great catalog, so Duran Duran has a history with Parlophone. Um, so producer of Uptown Funk produced yeah. this record. Yeah, we, so we hopefully this is going to be something that reinvigorates a whole global interest in Duran Duran. Ah, Tegan and Sarah. Tegan and Sarah. Canadian. Canadian, fantastic. Uh, also connected to Neil and to Elliot. Um, they were on, on, on the Vapor Records label for a while and um, now uh, strict, uh, straight to Warner Brothers, but we love them. Academy Award nomination last year and um, I think you know, global, global superstar. I'm ahead for the two of them. I think they're just uh, brilliant artists, brilliant songwriters, and truly a Canadian treasure. A couple of other things coming up that I thought uh, the audience would be interested to hear from you on. Of course, uh, here they are clothed. They're wearing clothes in this one, of course, at the Grammys. Uh, but such yeah, a great, I mean, great we could band. Go, we could go on and on. I'm so fortunate to work with so many great artists, but um, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Green Day, um, Linkin Park, uh, I probably don't have pictures of all of them, but um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a treat for me. All, 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 of, these, all of these terrific artists. Uh, Warner Brothers, it's a, it's, a, it's a testament to the people that came before me and the people who've worked there over the years. And I think I, you know the the culture and the history of the company, which is just so focused on, on you know um, talent, on artists, on songwriters, on music. The, the you know you look at all these artists and 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 really how incredible they are. It's, it's, it's you know Cameron, I must say one of the things I was always impressed uh, about yourself from your prior history, even before you joined Warner's, you always said when you're working with artists, there's one thing that you've got to be. You've got to be honest. Be open with them, be open with them about their music. But what you've just described during the time we've been together here about the way you approach things, the way that you are always looking at the artistic integrity and also the personal integrity of what the label does, what you're doing is you're extending this great, great legacy of what made Warner Brothers Records so great with Mo Austin and Lenny Warnaker in the past, but you're doing it with a view to the future. Some of these acts, Kaya, Stewart, just looking at these, the talent that you're doing things with. I mean, this is, this is pretty great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that we, um, you know, we try to live up to that. I'm fortunate Mo is still, still around. I get to have lunch with him sometimes, and Lenny comes, still comes to the office and works with us, and he's kind enough to spend an hour with me here and there and let me know, you know, how things are going or, or different ways to look at things. But they, um, the company has such a great soul, such a great history that there's, um, a, a, that, you know, it, uh, Bringing that forward, it's a it's a challenge. The bars raise very high, but we take it on every day, and I think we do we do a great job with it. Finding new talent, building careers, and um, and one of the other things I could just interrupt you. You really are looking to the future. You've set up a program at Stanford University to train executives coming into the business. You've got a great relationship with iTunes. They're your biggest customer. But more important than that, when you first saw Steve Jobs launching. The iTunes App Store in 2003, it made an impact on you, and your view is the future, but remembering the history and the artistic integrity of what's been drawn, and all of this comes from this Vancouver background. Do you think it's your dad's love of music <laughs> that infused this incredible career path where you are now yeah. doing this really terrific musical work? I, I think, you know, a couple of things. I don't really think there is a career path in the music business to some extent. You, you kind of have to follow the passion of it and, 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 and figure it out. And, and I think a lot of the, um, you know, when you find something that you're really passionate about, you don't mind doing that. You take the risk, you work hard, it doesn't feel like work, and, and good things happen. Um, I, I, I think the future of the music business and the future uh, of music is, is in good hands. You know, the, the, the artists themselves, the songwriters, every year I'm amazed, you know, every single year I wonder, I go to some of the you know, some of the different award shows are just in our building. I'm, I'm listening to records and you wonder, how, how, what, what are they going to do next? How are these great artists going to top the, these incredible records that they made this year? And, and every year they do. They come back with more great music, great songs. The hits are amazing. And, um, you know, that part of it's not going to change. So it, it's, 
it's easy to get lost in a lot of noise and a lot of other things, a lot of different things that are going on, but at the end of the day, when you have just the most courageous artists and the most courageous songwriters and producers who are making incredible music, uh, you're gonna be okay, because that's, that's really the lifeblood of, of all of this stuff, and I think that the, um, you know, whether they're new companies, technology companies, all, all of that, it, it all, a lot of it runs on music in our, in our space, and I think to, um, as a company to move forward and to move forward in that world, um, you know, we can't just, if people say, oh, you have to embrace change, and yes, you have to embrace change as a company, that's important, you've got to, you've got to embrace change, but really you have to meet it halfway. So inside the company, you've got to change. You know, we have, uh, you had a picture up earlier of Len Blavatnik, who's our new owner, we're privately owned, but Len's a great believer in change and pushing forward, and he encourages us to take risk and to do new things, and we're very fortunate to have you know, long-term ownership who's looking in at very, very long-term value. And, um, and, he, and he encouraged us to change the, the company and we, we do that. So we have, you know, we're, look, I'm incredibly fortunate to run a company that's based in Los Angeles. We, Silicon Valley's not far. It's, I don't have to drive the Volkswagen van there anymore. But um, uh, we can go up there and, and meet people and, and it's young people who are, gonna, who, are, who are gonna really bring us forward. So Cameron, uh, just to close off for this fascinating uh, in view and just a trip through both your mind and your, and your professional pursuits with the art, artists that you work with, they say that there are three things that you love. One is staying off the phone so that you can listen to music. The second thing is swimming in the ocean. And the third thing is really loving listening to music and talking with and being with writers and at the same time your your legal training and your background also shows that you're one of the very few executives that can marry the business constant with the musical constant with the creative constant i mean this is an interesting amalgam born as you clearly identify with your canadian roots your canadian background so it's for all of those reasons it's just been such a privilege to be with you here this year and Canadian Music Week. So ladies and gentlemen, please, this is really somebody of great, great creative and artistic integrity. Cameron Strand. Thank you.